Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar on cross-generational marketing and uh, who's up next presentation. Before I start, I'd like uh, to um, announce that you're able of posting your questions or tweeting your questions uh, during the session while tweeting to this account, Add Insights. Or if you don't have Twitter, you can also just send an email to natalie at insights-consulting.com. Or you can use the YouTube chat box if you're connected with YouTube. If you have an account on Gmail, you can just post them below this video uh, in the chat box and then we'll find your questions also. So three ways to post your questions, Twitter, just an email or use the YouTube uh, chat box. So let's start. This presentation is a presentation on uh, the next generation. And uh, I'm Yuri Vandenberg, by the way. Welcome. And let's have some music first to start this presentation. <laughs> So why a presentation on uh, the different generations, the past years? I've been doing a lot of in-company workshops and conference presentations on millennials, Generation Y, the young adults, you could say. And typically after this presentation, I got two questions. Uh, the first being, uh, are you really sure that there are differences between generations? Can you prove that there are differences between the different generations? For instance, some baby boomer or uh, Generation X uh, guy or girl would say, I feel the same. Uh, if you tell me what is typical for millennials, I have the same type of stuff. Are you really sure there are differences? And the second question would be, uh, okay, that's millennials, Generation Y, but what about the next generation? What about kids? What about the teens? The, how, how are they called? Generation Z. Um, so are they different from Generation Y or Millennials? And these topics um, will also be part of a new chapter on Generation Z in the third edition of How Cool Brands Stay Hot, which Kogan Page is publishing in March next year. And you're about to see some uh, previews, the premiere, you could say, of some results of a new study we have done. That is the backbone of this new edition of How Cool Brands Stay Hot. What we've done is actually we've interviewed 10,000 people from four different generations. So not only Gen Z, the youngest ones, four to 18 year olds, but also of course the millennials, 19 to 35 year olds. The parents of Generation Z called Generation X. So that's the 36 to 50 year olds. And then the parents of millennials, the baby boomers um, were actually uh, for the moment, 51 to 69 years old. So we've interviewed these people in eight different countries across Europe, but also in the US and uh, in Australia. And I'll show you some results in this presentation specifically for the European uh, region. If you're interested in the US results, we have uh, another webinar coming up later in the US time zone. First, let me ask you a question we, off we have also asked in the survey to uh, Generation Z and their parents, actually. It is about the weekly allowance that young people get, specifically four to 10 year olds. How much do they earn on a weekly basis? How much do they get from their parents? And uh, this is again Europe. Would, do you think that 53%, so almost half of them uh, in Europe between the age of four and 10 get a weekly allowance? Or do you think it's rather 43%, so the option to the right? Uh, what do you think yourself? From the study, we've seen that it's 53%, and it depends on country to country. Um, for instance, in the Nordics and the Netherlands, it would be even higher, more like 60%, up to 70% of the 4 to 10 year olds that get a weekly allowance. On average, by the way, um, Generation Z, so 4 to 18 year olds, get 11 euros a week almost. And Generation Y, millennials, those who still get a weekly allowance, most of them are still living with their parents, they get 24.5 euros, 24 and a half euros uh, a week. So a lot of money, you could say, uh, a lot of income at their disposal. And uh, the good news for us as marketers um, or companies is that most of this weekly allowance is actually spent 
only 20% is saved um, and the rest is spent on, um, as you can see, these uh, categories. Mm, the older they get, the more they spend on fashion. So that's the clothes hanging on the washing line. Um, but food, snacks, uh, not fish uh, most of the time, but rather candy bars or sweets um, or candy is an important category for the youngest. And then you have mobile, you have going out and uh, hobbies. And what we see is that these five categories are important for the total next gen population, uh, where there's a difference, of course, the younger, the more they're spent on uh, hobbies and snacks, the older they get, the more the mobile going out and, and fashion categories become important to them. So this is part of the powerful uh, next uh, gen. Next gen is the combination of Gen Y and Gen Z. But of course, it's not the only reason why we study the next generation, because apart from their own spendings, they are also influencing the spendings of their parents. Um, as uh, I've told you before, many millennials actually are still living with their parents. It's called the boomerang uh, tendency. So boomerang children, hotel mama effect. And one question could be, what type of spendings are they influencing at, at their parents' home? Would that be the food they're consuming together with their parents? Or you think it's rather technologies they adopt, uh, like uh, decisions on buying a new mobile phone or a new laptop, which kind of brands do parents want to buy? Or it could be a subscription to Netflix or other um, content um, online. And the, uh, the answer we saw in our study in Europe was that they have the biggest influence on the food they're consuming together with their parents. This, this is the graph. It's a combination of Gen Y and Gen Z. And as you can see, the number one category is uh, the food they're consuming. And number two is actually technologies they adopt. So it's a combination of, of both, but number one, food. And it's not just that, it's also the type of holiday destinations the parents are choosing, uh, type of cities they're visiting, uh, products they're buying, grocery stores they visit, and even the TV programs they're watching. Typically, when they watch TV together with their parents, it's, it's kind of quality time, so parents agree with the choice of their children so that they can still uh, experience this moment together, sitting in the couch uh, and watching the TV set. So two things, important generation because they have money themselves, uh, much more money than in the past. And second, they're also influencing the parents' uh, spendings. That's the reason why we want to study the DNA of the next gen, Gen Y and Gen Z. And in the rest of the presentation, the coming 30 minutes, I will talk about three different DNA characteristics. Um, and for the first one, I have a next question for you, a rhetorical question. Who do you think is messaging the most with their friends while they're watching TV content? And you think it's Gen Z, so 4 to 19 year olds, or millennials, 19 to 35 year olds? The results in our study show that it's uh, actually Gen Z, the youngest ones. And this is the uh, graph associated with that study. Uh, as you can see, the, the second series of bars, the orange bar is Gen Z. The greenish bar is millennials. Um, you see the peak of the orange bar when it comes to messaging with friends while watching TV, whereas all uh, next gen, so also the millennials are actually using social media as well, or even answering emails, something that Gen Z is doing less because they're not professionally active. Millennials, they tend to uh, fuse their private lives with their professional lives, so they do answer emails while they're still watching uh, TV content, surfing the internet and, and playing games. But when it comes to messaging, it is uh, the youngest that are more into uh, doing that while watching TV. So the first characteristic is actually, uh, we call them snappy. Snappy means, uh, like Snapchat, quite direct, efficient, and also witty, quite uh, intelligent about using uh, these type of media. When I would ask you, what was the most popular word in 2014 in, in messaging? What do you think uh, was used the most while texting or messaging uh, with friends? You're probably thinking of uh, lol or haha or even selfie or FOMO. Um, but the, 
most used thing was actually another word in 2014 because today this young generation uh, is an emotional generation they communicate using emojis emoticons or gifs um, visual content actually so uh, the most used emoji was actually the heart emoji and um, when we look at the type of messages we get from the youngest i have two daughters uh, aged 8 and 11 they send me messages like this and um, to them it's the most efficient most snappy way of communicating the most uh, direct way of trying to tell me something to me as a poor dad i'm i'm lost in translation actually and i'm quite confused when i look at these type of messages i try to figure out what they're trying to tell me and in most cases they're not trying to tell me anything at all they just want to show me that they're thinking of me um, but it's the new style it's a new type of communication and i'm not sure if uh, how many of you are actually using these type of communications i mean not just using emojis but skipping the text but if you do it's good news because uh, what we see in studies this is a study done by an online dating site called match.com is that people who use emojis actually they have a bigger chance of, of getting late so it's a good thing that you use a lot of uh, emojis this is of course a correlation as we call it in market research um, with um, being more extrovert uh, so using another type of communication some tips when you uh, do want to use emojis in your daily communication the frisky cat is very useful and the cha-cha lady uh, as well the cha-cha lady actually means when you're a girl most of the time it means hey i want to have some fun tonight are you in for some uh, fun and uh, we already saw katarina zita jones during the last golden globe uh, awards golden globes awards on the red carpet imitating a cha-cha lady so for some reason she wanted to show to people that she was in for some fun uh, that night now of course this is a joke the question is um, what do we do as marketers with this type of new communication style? And the answer is, of course, that we should change our way of communicating. If you look at IKEA, for instance, they have launched their own emoticon library uh, so that people are able to communicate with each other about their IKEA visits um, when they want to talk about the Swedish meatballs or some of the iconic furniture or even the shopping bag or the IKEA family cart, they can just use the emoji. They don't need to use uh, text anymore. And also other brands like McDonald's have uh, their own emojis. Uh, Colette, the hipster store in Paris, actually asked McDonald's, can we use your hamburger emojis and print it on a limited edition T-shirt uh, and sell it in, um, in our store? So it's clear that this visual language style, it's becoming more and more important to connect with the youngest generations. Um, Mentos in the uh, candy market is also using uh, this type of visual communication. Introducing FOMO, a fresh way to express yourself, brought to you by Mentos. So just another example of using visual communications, Mentos is actually using the shape of their products to create this new library of uh, emanticons. One trend related to being snappy as a generation is actually using ephemeral media. Ephemeral media means that you use media that will disappear in a moment or in a few seconds. So Snapchat is, of course, a good example of that. It's only there for maximum 10 seconds, um, most of the time less than 10 seconds. So if you really want to see the message, you have to focus uh, on the message. And that's actually the trick in using ephemeral media is that you demand the attention of the short attention span uh, next gen and generation Z. Uh, research from Microsoft has shown that the attention span today is only uh, eight seconds, which is actually below the attention span of a goldfish. So if you want to catch the attention, well, you, you need to adapt your communication style. 
and some social media uh, like Snapchat, but also Vine, uh, actually understand that there is a shorter attention span. Vine videos are only six seconds, so it's hard to get bored actually during six seconds. Uh, some Vine videos are really great, like this one. A great use of Vine videos and also uh, Miley Cyrus. Always good to use uh, Miley Cyrus in your campaigns. So we'll come back to that later on. Now, uh, another example of using ephemeral media is actually live streaming, like this live stream actually, because then you're really doing something in the moment and being in the moment is quite important to next gen, of course. So when you really have a big announcement to make, like a product launch, you can use live streaming. Uh, Red Bull, for instance, has used Periscope to live stream events that they're sponsoring. Or another way to use it is actually uh, uh, like L'Oreal did on a red carpet event, introducing a new product. They used Meerkat, it's about the same. Tweeting live uh, video uh, will get the attention of people that want to see what's happening at that moment. Otherwise, they will miss uh, the whole message and the whole point. So that's snappy media, ephemeral media. There's also um, this trend, it's called the age of impatience. In our study, we also asked to uh, the different generations, are you watching OTT content, over the top content? Do you watch TV content online? And what we saw was that it's uh, mostly the youngest generations, so millennials and generation Z, that tend to go online to watch TV content because they don't want to miss uh, the new uh, show of House of Cards or Game, Game of Thrones. They want to see it even before it's even out in their own region. So to them, it's a way to really see a new season of a great show before it's even out in their region. And what we see in the age of impatience is that this is an example of a Chinese uh, village or city where you have this separate pavement for people that walk uh, faster, whereas people that are looking at their mobile screen, they walk slower, so they should take another lane because people don't want to wait for the slower people. And the same goes for, uh, for shopping centers. This mall in the US, for instance, uh, has a slow lane for people watching the windows of the shops and a fast lane for people going directly to one shop because they don't want to frustrate people that don't have the time to wait uh, anymore. And of course, the whole digital trend, combining physical stores with digital pre-ordering or uh, pre-selecting is uh, related to this age of impatience. Uh, Starbucks, for instance, has this mobile app. Uh, in, they're trying it out in Portland, Oregon in 120 stores. You can order your coffee or your sandwich um, with your mobile, pay up front, and then you just pick it up in the store without having to queue. Same goes for Kentucky Fried Chicken with the Express app. It's prepaid, you just pick up your chicken burger and you're ready. So when translating this to marketing communications, um, we should think of our formats. Are we still creating 20 second videos, 30 second commercials? And is that a good idea if we have a uh, next gen that has a short attention span? Um, to me, shorter formats are not all, always the answer because, um, well, they can even get bored within five seconds. It's all about creating compelling content and creative ideas. And the next spot is a good example of that. Don't thank me. Thank the savings. You can't skip this Geico ads because it's already over. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. One minute and two seconds of video and 7.3 million views within two weeks. 
Um, and of course, the key message is within the first five seconds because you have five seconds pre-roll advertisements on YouTube. Um, but the brand is there for one minute and two seconds and people want to see what's happening with the dog throughout the entire commercial. And of course, dogs and children are still working in advertising. But if you have a creative idea, then I think you can still use longer formats uh, as well. On the other hand, it's clear that the age of impatience means that next gen wants an on-demand experience and some brands like uber are actually the market leader in on-demand experience it's not just when you want a car at this moment that you can use their network of drivers but also if you like a fresh meal you have uber fresh delivering fresh meals within 10 minutes and the same 10 minute rule is used for delivering uh, 7-eleven items you need with the same network of drivers amazon is um, doing it in another way they are actually creating this type of physical dash buttons that you can stick to a place where you want to stick it for instance on your washing machine or near your mirror if you want some shavers or you want washing detergent you need washing detergent you just push the button physically and it will automatically order your stuff in this case tight uh, washing detergent online with amazon without even having to grab for your phone or going to your laptop and going online this button is pre-programmed so that it orders the stuff you need and it's delivered same day delivery by uh, amazon so that's the first dna uh, aspect it's all about being snappy on demand uh, experience and ephemeral media the second one is related to dreaming of a better world this young generation wants to create a better society a better world and so one of the questions we've asked in our study was, are you in favor of gender equality? Um, and again, you have two different generations over there. You have the baby boomers, 51 to 69 year olds, and Gen Y millennials, 19 to 35 year olds. So who do you think was most in favor of this gender equality? What we saw in our study was, to our own surprise, by the way, that it's the baby boomers. And uh, if you look at the results, it's, it's quite a close result, but the question where we do see some differences is um, it's in the nature of women to stay at home and raise a family. It's actually less um, baby boomers agree than Gen Xers and millennials. Um, and if you look in, in uh, to the details, and I'm sorry about the colors are not really correct here, um, it's actually Generation Z, the youngest generation, 4 to 19 year olds, that are most in favor of gender equality. So one trend related to this uh, gender equality is actually blurring genders. Um, perhaps you know this girl, her name is uh, Shilo. She's the daughter actually of Brad Pitt and uh, Angelina Jolie. And at the start of this year, actually Brad and Angelina decided to call her John instead of Shilo because she feels more like a boy uh, since uh, she was only three years old. And so this difference between feeling like a boy, being a girl, we see this happening in society. And of course, Miley Cyrus is a good example as well, because she said that she doesn't agree with the pre-definition of uh, genders. So she doesn't feel like a girl or a boy. Um, it's more blurred. And this is celebrities, but if you look into fashion, for instance, uh, one of the trends in the past years uh, was actually this type of jeans called the boyfriend jeans. So it, um, a male jeans uh, that women are wearing um, as uh, a way to actually express their, their identity. And when I was in uh, Scandinavia a few months ago and also in Milan last week, uh, I actually saw that the hipster boys uh, today are wearing the jeans like the girlfriends are wearing the boyfriend jeans so boys are actually wearing a female boyfriend type of jeans if you're still following it's quite confusing which is uh, the proof that there is a blurring uh, gender in the end um, now many um, brands within the fashion markets especially luxury brands like gucci prada givenchy saint laurent they have gender neutral uh, collections today and also Selfridges has launched this three-story pop-up store selling 40 different brands uh, with mixed clothes for males and females. So you won't find a separate section in the shop with male clothes or female clothes. They're just mixing uh, the collection because they know 
that the blurring, that the gender lines are actually blurring. Now, this is fashion and celebrities. Perhaps you think, okay, it's still kind of a specific industry. What does it mean for my sector? Um, when we look at more traditional industries like the content industry, Walt Disney is quite a traditional brand, you could say. Until 2009, this was the typical storyline uh, with typical role patterns, actually. There's a girl, a beautiful girl, cleaning the house or preparing meals for midgets. And then suddenly a prince comes along, they kiss, they fall in love, and she's invited in the castle, they marry, they get kids, and she can start all over cleaning the castle and preparing meals for the kids. But that's the typical traditional pattern until 2009. What happened in 2009 is that Disney created uh, The Princess and the Frog with Tiana as a lead character, female lead character. 2010, there's Rapunzel in Tangled, and um, again, female lead character. And then in 2013, the, the uh, most successful franchise and um, movie of Disney ever, Frozen, was launched with two girls act actually, Anna and Elsa, two sisters, all about uh, sisterhood, female bonding, and that's the new storyline of Disney. There was also Brave with Merida, and there's coming a, 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 a Frozen 2. So it's clear that to Disney, female empowerment, strong female characters are the new way of, um, of connecting with the youngest generation, and it means something. This is the way Mattel actually tries to connect with the youngest. They have created the uh, Barbie Entrepreneur, um, so it's a businesswoman, you could say. She's still wearing uh, a pink dress, though, and jewels and high heels. Um, and actually, Mattel used this type of posters, flowcharts, to announce uh, the Barbie entrepreneur, because, of course, the target group of Mattel are, on average, five-year-old girls. So how do you explain entrepreneurship to a five-year-old? They're using this flowchart saying, do you love cooking? Do you love crafts? Do you love animals? And when you say yes, there is a certain job related to crafts, animals, and cooking. That in the universe of Mattel is actually the definition of female uh, entrepreneurship. Now, in the meantime, they understand that this is not really working with the youngest generation. This is not the definition of female empowerment. So uh, what they saw was actually four years in a row, they saw declining sales figures of the Barbie. And they're now launching a new series, a new line of dolls, but also content um, using the theme of superheroes, female superheroes. They're doing it together with DC Comics and Warner Brothers later this year. This is kids content. If you look into adult content, you would see that uh, also there in HBO, Netflix type of content, uh, House of Cards and Game of Thrones, strong female characters, even if there is a Kevin Spacey, there is still uh, the lead female character that's actually uh, in charge of uh, whatever is happening in the White House. You also uh, have the Hunger Games Divergent, uh, the new type of movies that really resonate with millennials and with Generation Z, all have female lead characters. That's content again. How do you translate that into other industries? I think we all should think of to use this female empowerment in our branding and in our communication campaigns. And Procter & Gamble is already doing so with using the Like A Girl uh, hashtag campaign. I lose like a girl. I, I run, run, run. Flip! 
So, Procter & Gamble with the Always brand started this campaign in 2014 and it was one of the best evaluated spots during the last Super Bowl, uh, also one of the most trending uh, Twitter uh, topics back then, more than 100 million views. And I know it's kind of the strategy that Unilever did with the campaign for real beauty but uh, Procter & Gamble also find out that this is the way to connect with the youngest generation. And this one is specifically built on female empowerment. So that's one way of dreaming of a better world, blurred gender. Another way has to do with the type of uh, world issues that the uh, next generation is concerned about. So one question we've asked in the survey is, who is the most concerned about health problems and virus outbreaks? Do you think it's the baby boomers, 50 to 70 year olds, or do you think it's uh, Generation Z, the youngest, 40 to 19 year olds? Perhaps you think it's the baby boomers because they're older and more concerned about their health. What we saw in our study is that it's actually Generation Z. This is the graph. As you can see, the top two items that they're concerned about are terrorism and the economic crisis. Economic crisis, that's less the case for Generation uh, Z than for other generations because they are not confronted with that problem yet. Most of them are not looking for work yet. Uh, but you also see that the orange bar, Generation Z, um, flips out when it comes to uh, health problems and virus outbreaks. It's more important to them than to uh, older generations. Same goes for racism and also for underdevelopment in third world countries. Uh, how many of you know this uh, young guy? This is um, a, a Dutch guy, 17 year old. His name is Boyan Slot. And um, perhaps you know the ocean cleanup because this Dutch guy he came up with during a holiday with the idea to clean up the ocean, to remove the plastics from the ocean. And so his idea was to create two giant arms that collect all the plastic waste using the ocean tide. And it was the first time actually that someone came up with this idea. So no other engineers, baby boomers, Gen X came up with this idea. It was this Generation Z guy who invented um, this way of cleaning the ocean. And he got the funding, he had an interview with John Kerry, and by 2020, the ocean will be cleaned thanks to a 17-year-old uh, guy. So this is an example of how this young generation is concerned about the planet. And we also see that some brands are, are already using this. Uh, for instance, G-Star G Row, uh, a denim brand, jeans brand, is creating a recycled pair of jeans uh, made from ocean uh, plastic. And they're also using Pharrell to promote it when the youngest. So this business model, one for one business model, buy one and donate one, give one, is something that really works with the youngest generation. For instance, Tom Shoes. Tom Shoes is known uh, for using this business model. If you, pair a, if you buy a pair of Tom Shoes, you're actually also donating a pair of shoes to uh, one of the millions of children that are not able to buy uh, shoes. So Tom Shoes, for instance, have um, donated 300,000 pairs of shoes to uh, the poor children. Another trend related to this dreaming of a better world is enoughism. If you have enough um, of uh, material stuff, if you're consuming all the time, if you're binge watching the Netflix series, at a certain point you feel it's enough. And what we see is a new trend actually, clubs for instance in Stockholm, like Sober, they're not selling any alcohol anymore. So you can only buy alcohol-free beer or mocktails when you go to Sober. We see um, breakfast raves popping up, some healthy breakfast and partying together, no drugs, no alcohol, lunch, break, parties uh, in different cities across the world. And we see all kinds of challenges, 20 days without meat, um, McCartney is in support of the Meatless Monday, for instance, but also 30 days without using my car, 40 days without using shampoo, so enoughism. And it's also challenging if you're in, active in one of these uh, industries, it's challenging your business model. How should you respond to this type of enoughism if you're actually 
selling shampoo or meat. It means that you need to have a point of view. You need to think of what are you doing back to society in case you're in this uh, industry. So that's all about uh, dreaming of a better world. And we come to the next DNA aspect, and it's related to this question. What brand characteristic do you think is most important to the youngest, the Generation Z? Would it be uh, socially engaged to doing something for society, or is it rather all about hyper-personalization, uh, creating your own uh, products, you think, for the youngest ones? And you see that Coca-Cola is doing both, so both being socially engaged and allowing personalization. But to the youngest, it's actually personalization that's working the best. If you look at this graph again, um, you will see that being socially engaged is less important to uh, Generation Y or to millennials, whereas um, allowing personalization is actually the higher orange uh, bar. So, okay, making it yourself, I am making it myself, it's important to Generation Z. When you compare Generation X, my generation, with other generations, it was all about prestige and status, showing that you have actually made it. You have a good career, you earn some money, and you show off. And when you compare it to millennials, Generation Y, it was all about using your friends, your network, the power of the collective, the we feeling, uh, to obtain something in life. So think of co-creation campaigns, but also um, the we selfies, you could say, and the flash mob uh, on wedding parties are examples of this we feeling. And now we come to Generation Z, the youngest generation, and suddenly it's all about I, me, myself and I again, because these youngest are actually the children of the Generation X. So they're more into individual thinking, less into the collective thinking of the baby boomers and Generation Y children of the baby boomers. So it's about leaving your own, your own mark in society, having an impact yourself uh, in society. So of course, in that case, personal skills become more important. And it's something that Nike is using with the Nike Academy. In Nike Academy, they're looking for young soccer players that want to improve their soccer skills by competing with other young soccer players. And in the end, being able to play a match to train together with the big stars that Nike is sponsoring, the celebrities that Nike is sponsoring. The me economy rather than the we economy, we economy, share economy is typical, something for millennials, Airbnb, for instance, uh, Uber. Um, what we see with the youngest is the me economy. So uh, individualizing my products is more important to them. And Lace that um, has done some co-creation campaigns in the past, that's a we economy, uh, finding a new flavor and then just um, producing it for the entire market. Today, they're actually doing this type of summer campaign. Create your own bag, create your own package of ships. And on the first 10,000 entrants that make a good, nice design, they actually receive a box with their own personalized uh, bag of, of ships. So that's the me economy. If you look at Minecraft, the very popular game, more than 100,000 active players, um, you see that it's all about creating your own game. You're actually creating your own universe, creating the game yourself, creating your own house. So it's all about me economy. And the second point, uh, second lesson from Minecraft that uh, actually sold to Microsoft for three and a half billion dollars um, is that the graphics look really poor. These graphics look like they were made in the 80s. Uh, and actually the game was developed in just one week by a Swedish guy. But it means that to the youngest generation, uh, imperfection is the new perfection. If it looks perfect, it's dull, it's boring. So imperfections are good because they're human and they're more uh, interesting than perfect products. So perhaps our products are too perfect. And it's also something that many food producers have understood. Uh, Kraft, for instance, has spent two years in an R&D lab to be able to create carving board uh, sliced turkey breast. So uh, turkey breast that looks like you yourself at home sliced it. It doesn't look like it's manufactured in a big, big company. So the craft feeling becomes more important, not only in food, but in, but in everything. And it means that uh, this imperfection um, is becoming more important. So people want to be perfectly imperfect. If you look at uh, celebrities that are connecting with the youngest. It's people like Jennifer Lawrence, uh, who uh, often uh, behaves like this on uh, public, um, 
public events, um, she isn't that perfect. She has her own uh, flaws, and that's important to really be human and authentic with the youngest. So imperfect people like Lena Dunham, for instance, she's uh, in her own biography, talking very openly about her medical problems uh, and her weird sex life in the in the past but she's also successful since 2012 she has her own series girls on hbo and suddenly she's one of the celebrities one of the spokesperson persons of this new generation you could say so generation z actually has this philosophy it's cool to fail and so we see events like fuck up nights and fail conferences where young entrepreneurs uh, want to talk about the mistakes they have made and the way they have fucked up their own business, the mistakes they made and what they've learned from it. So actually failure today to the youngest is an option, whereas to Gen X, we would never have talked about our failures, only the good things uh, we have done. Today on YouTube, um, where you uh, are watching this video today, it's, it's full of fail videos. There's 30 million fail videos. So suddenly failing is like the new uh, achievement because it's better to be absolutely ridiculous like in a fail video than it is to be absolutely boring to the young generation and i want to end my presentation before uh, wrapping it up with this uh, new campaign of nike that is actually using this type of imperfections yes the middle seat's open they look so non-judgmental No shame in running half a half marathon. Two miles? Oh, good. A bunch of models right in front of me. Okay, yoga. Change my life. And focus on something else. Why are there so many mirrors? Don't mind me over here, little baby weights, baby arms. What am I even doing? This is actually really motivating. I love running. It's really fun. Exercise reduces stress. Steady. I got this. Oh, I can't. Almost there. I can't. Brady. I can't. I did it. Let's go again. So the 2015 campaign of Nike is full of I can'ts, where it used to be the brand of just do it, sponsoring athletes and also trying to find people that want to become the next athlete. The type of uh, tone of voice they're using today is much more human, much more recognizable, more the way that you and I uh, are actually doing sports with a lot of flows and just imperfections. So to sum up, to wrap up the presentation, we've been talking about the uh, DNA aspects of the next gen, uh, three dimensions. They're snappy, they are dreaming of a better world, and they want to make something themselves. Six different consumer trends related to that. Ephemeral media, the age of impatience or the on-demand economy related to being snappy, but also two examples of dreaming of a better world could be blurred gender or enoughism. That's just two illustrations of this creating a better world. And then the me economy and being perfectly imperfect are related to creating something yourself to the, to, to the maker movement, you could say. And you translate that to branding. It means if you want to address this young generation um, and you want to use ephemeral media, snappy media, then you actually have to become a content brand because if you use um, video, if you use Snapchat, if you use Vine, you need new content every day to keep the attention of the short attention span generation. We also need to deliver more fast in the, in the market, uh, the on-demand society. Think of the slow lane and the fast lanes. If they are dreaming of a better world, you need to have a macro positioning, which means uh, what's your point of view? What are you doing for society? Are you creating a new society? And even better, how are you asking your consumers to contribute to creating a better society? Think of the one-for-one one, uh, business model like Tom Shoes. And then in the last part, I am making it. We want to help our consumers to create their own brand instead of creating a brand for them. So that's a micro-me positioning. 
Uh, it's also the craft feeling about products, the flaws, the imperfections. So the better idea. We have a minimum viable product and we want to launch it soon and then improve it with the feedback of our customers instead of spending two years in an R&D lab, actually. So that's it, basically. I hope you liked uh, the content. Um, if you have any questions, you can still ask them on, on Twitter. These are my contact uh, details, by the way. You can find me on Twitter as well. If you want still to send me a question, now is the right time to do it. Uh, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and you will also find the How Cool Brands Stay Hot blog on the internet. So any questions, you can tweet them using my Twitter address or the at insights account. Or you can email your questions to Natalie at insights-consulting.com or just use the chat box below this video if, you're, uh, if you do have a YouTube account, Gmail account. And uh, no questions at this point, then um, it's time to wrap up. You can still send questions if you like and make sure I will answer them later today. And um, thanks a lot for your interest for this webinar. Talk about webinars, um, if you're interested in this type of uh, content. We have a next one uh, coming up online uh, on December the 1st, and it's called the Mimification of Insights. So it's the next webinar. To me, uh, it sounds pretty interesting because we will um, talk about our latest paper, our latest ISMR paper, paper that has just received uh, nice awards on the latest global conference in Dublin. So if you want to hear all about this award-winning paper and our story on the mimification of insights, you have to uh, tune in on December 1st, 2015. Hope to see you back soon, online or wherever. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye-bye.